Thanks for listening to the Pop Culture Cosmos and the PCC Multiverse. Check out more great podcasts today on one of these awesome affiliate networks. You're listening to a Weeby Geeks Network podcast. You're listening to the ESO Network, your station for all things geek. The Tangibound Network. Check it out. Tangiboundnetwork.com. Listen to this show, the latest episode, every time. A proud member of the Gunna Geek Network. The opinions expressed are those of each individual. Check out all the other geeky podcasts over at GunnaGeekNetwork.com and get ready because geekiness begins in three, two, one. On this week's episode, a recap of CES 2019, a controversial decision from Skydance. And what is the true destiny now for Bungie? All this and more as we reach our next stop, the PCC Multiverse. Don't be alarmed. The quasi-shimmering light before you is a trans-dimensional gateway to other worlds, other voices, other thoughts, and other realities. Up feels like down, and down feels like the number seven on a Wednesday morning. Don't worry. That quivering, blood-boiling sensation under your eyebrows is all a part of the charm. Welcome to the PCC Multiverse. Yes, we're back with another edition of the PCC Multiverse. This is Gerald Glassford from Pop Culture Cosmos and Game Source, thanking you for listening to all of our great programs. But it wouldn't be a PCC Multiverse without my good friend, he is the man with the plan when it comes to Humanica Media. you got to listen to everything that's going on today at HumanicaMedia.com, Humanica Media on Facebook, YouTube, Instagram, and so much more. It is my good friend. Still bummed he couldn't make the ride up here for CES. It is Josh Peterson. What's going on, my friend? What's up? What's up? Yeah, I, I've been seeing your footage from CES all week, man. It sounds like you had quite an adventure and i imagine you had some pretty good interviews going on did you see anything i'm sure we're going to talk about this but i do want to know if you saw anything that you think is a game changer in terms of future tech Hmm. well i'll actually let you in on that one coming up here in just a few minutes because we're going to go ahead and break down ces 2019 as i saw it Yes, I did get a lot of interviews that I'm going to be playing throughout the rest of the month on all of our shows, including the Pop Culture Cosmos and the PCC Multiverse. I got about 20 interviews total, so that's going to be great, including three today with one more, Ampere and the Atari Pong Tables from Eunice. A lot of great interviews there, plus a lot more coming up in the coming episodes as well. Plus today we're going to be talking about an unusual and very controversial decision when it comes to Skydance animation. And then also later on in the broadcast, we're also going to be talking about Bungie's breakaway from Activision. But first, my friend, I want to talk about CES 2019. You asked me if there was some game changers. And my answer to that is for an overall theme, I'm going to probably say no. There was no real central theme usually going on like on some other past CES where like one year would be like everybody was into VR or one another year everybody was into like Android consoles or another year everybody was like blowing up with 4K. Everybody just seemed to be doing a lot of their own thing. Uh, wearables were there, but it wasn't like in mass, like in your face all over the place like it was a couple of years ago. It just was no real central theme, no, you know, robotics, drones, VR. They were all there. They were all mixed in, but it didn't really just seem to overwhelm everybody like it has in the past. 8K is now something that's on the horizon for a lot of manufacturers out there. They were showing off their goods and you did not see, I'm going to give you an example of this. You did not see any real 4K televisions or 4K streaming outputs or 4K streaming anything. Everything there was 8K, but it wasn't in your face. It wasn't overloading everything out there. It wasn't pushing 8K as as the now, as it's got to have it right now. 8K is still on the horizon because we're just getting into 4K and there's still a lot of streaming outlets and visual outlets, whether it's broadcast or cable or satellite television, that still doesn't produce a lot of material in 4K. 
So are you saying this is kind of like when, um, you know, cameras were first able to film in 1080, right? There wasn't a lot of software that was able to process it. So, for example, Blackmagic is a big cinema camera company, you know, not as big as Red, but they produce things in, you know, you could do it in 1080, you could do it in RAW, but Adobe, the, like the, the industry standard software, was not able to process, uh, did not have software that could process it at that time. So is that kind of what you're getting at with 4K? In Absolutely. Industry? Okay. They're showing off, and it looks great in simulated formats. The fields where it's all full of colors that pop and, and you know, all the, the scenes that you see when you're there or when you're going by in your department stores and you see that standard DVD or Blu-ray that's being shown a loop on a loop over and over and over again. You see all that at CES. Now it's an 8K form as opposed to seeing it in 4K like you would at a local Costco or, or Walmart or wherever. And it's yeah it's it's beautiful 70 8k which was 7800 pixels uh, yeah, on on most of these television was just absolutely stunning gorgeous beyond all description for now but it's something that's like okay you took a look at it it's wow it's nice the sizes are getting larger and larger i mean samsung debuted what a 219 you know inch screen you know just a big wall set up and all the, they they debuted a big wall set up as far as a nice display and all that but that is still impressive tech but it's that's down the road that's not affordable for the individual consumer right now it's not available for the individual consumer right now at large a lot of the appliances were, were great as far as the smart technology built in. It's just getting smarter and smarter about what types of foods you're eating for refrigerators, helping you select that, uh, becoming more eco-friendly with washers and dryers and, and smart closets and things of that nature. But the thing that impressed me most was actually what I found in the South Hall. And that's something I have not seen before when it comes to CES because I've been to CES now Oh, closing in since what? Since 1996. I've been I've been doing this quite a few years now. But each and every year that I go to CES, CES has only devoted a small amount of real estate to gaming of any type. They usually put in the South Hall, way in the back, tuck it to the left, and there you go. Only about two or three aisles, and that's it. This year, it was so much more, and I was so pleasantly surprised. And that, to me, is the big takeaway, is how much gaming was out in front with some major primetime space. A lot of companies that had small booths and small areas in the past really forking over some hard-earned cash to really put out there some great booths that are out there that really impressed, that were out in a larger, more high-traffic areas than ever before the gaming and VR area, and it wasn't just devoted to VR, which was the best part about it. It wasn't just devoted to VR areas because in the past few years, any gaming space was really devoted to VR. Now it was more like a true 50-50 VR and retro gaming, and it wasn't even PlayStation 4, Xbox One. Virtually all of it was retro gaming. And a lot of the vendors that I spoke to that were there were just so thrilled with the chance and opportunity to go ahead and be more in the limelight at CES with a lot of retro gaming. I'm going to give you an example. Like later today, the interview I did with Eunice with their Atari Pong tables, that had a space near up front on the South Hall, which is really a you know very expensive, but also a great thing to show off because a lot more people are going to go see it. I'm going to talk to the folks at My Arcade. Arcade One Up, which had a huge Black Friday season, they're they're thrilled as heck is going, you know, with, with what their company is going through, and and my arcade with a, a lot of great things that are going on there as well. Just all these retro companies now are in a larger spotlight because retro is in. People are buying, people are getting into all the retro arcade machines, the retro gaming platforms that are allowing a lot of retro gaming that happen. And to me, that was the biggest and most pleasant surprise was how much CES devoted to gaming, especially retro gaming, and how much they actually care about it now that it's back in the marketplace and it's back strong. It obviously shows that there's a lot of dollars being spent on retro gaming, and I'm glad to see it. It's interesting you say that because Forbes put out an article is last year, I want to say, where they're saying that right now 
if you have anything you know any ideas pertaining to retro gaming like this is the time to do it because retro gaming is in and people are you know they're they are cashing in on the nostalgia like the the nostalgia fad so they're trying people are looking for sega games nintendo games like there's a big market for that kind of thing so a lot of people who have opened you notice there's been a lot of a lot more retro gaming stores popping up in the past you know two or three years and that's something that um you know there is a market for this stuff people are looking for that kind of thing you go on the internet you see a lot more retro stores there are games that are, are stores that did not sell retro games before but now they're starting to buy back sega genesis games nintendo games super nintendo games because people are are looking for these things and it's uh you know the future it's funny because i don't know if i want to say it all comes back around but the future is retro if if that makes sense because even in the uh the indie gaming scene you're seeing 2d platformers coming back out and people trying to recreate the uh the nostalgia of you know 80s arcades game 80 arcades games look at uh, princess madeline is a good example or celeste these these types of games they're coming back and people like them people want more of them when i talked about being out front when it comes to ces out more in the limelight that includes companies like Enix, like you were talking about, which is huge into retro gaming and retro accessories. They were talking to me at length with an inter- in an interview I'll probably be playing next week about all the good stuff that they're coming up with that's all retro gaming based, stuff that they produced over the past couple of years, a retro arcade machine, also retro handheld that has done very well for them. A lot of retro accessories that are on the way that they're gonna make for this year that they're go- that they're going to introduce this year to the marketplace that they're really excited about and obviously it shows because Enix is a company that when they've had space in CES they like I said they've been tucked into the back into the corner and and just not a lot of people have have been able to get a chance to see them or they've been you know it maybe in the central hall but they were just like put kind of put off into the distance where it was not a lot of high traffic well you know what they were the first thing you see as you came into the South Hall was NX and the retro gaming. And it's just great to see that retro gaming is now back in style. Companies like NX, Unis with the Atari Pongs, My Arcade, Arcade One Up, and a lot more. All these companies that are benefiting off of retro gaming. And it's just great to see. And uh, yes, there was a lot of great things to see at CES. Sony, I stopped by that booth. Samsung was obviously very good. A lot of other companies were were very detailed in what they wanted to show off, but I just did not see something that they wanted to go ahead and showcase above any other that they wanted to promote any above any other, and it was just like they were there. But the presence of the retro gaming, I think, really made it special for me after seeing so many years of the way gaming has been treated by CES. Well, if you think about it, gaming is actually a huge part of future tech, right? Because we're looking at new gaming engines that are allowing people to use new lighting techniques, you know, new 3D or 2D, whatever, platforming techniques that weren't available before, kind of making old things new. And especially like, you know, for example, I got Final Fantasy Royal Edition for Christmas. So I was playing that and my dad walks in and he goes, hey, this looks this looks real. So, I mean, to someone who isn't, you know, who isn't playing every game coming out and if you've only played, you know, something old and then you're jumping on something new, like gaming is is a huge piece of of future tech and that's kind of it's interesting because you know it it makes you wonder how far can gaming go before it becomes real kind of like bandersnatch but it also is you know it 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 is measurable progress between what was and what is and what we can do and so i think that gaming is kind of just as important to future technologies televisions or you know a self-cleaning litter box or whatever it is like it just shows gaming is innovation beyond any is measurable innovation if that makes sense no i didn't get a chance to see the cat toilet but you know what can i say i didn't get to see the chance to see the iCat toilet but maybe next year for that but it was a great year for retro gaming at ces i'm going to be talking later on with with the head of Eunice talking about the Atari Pong tables, which actually isn't the old analog display that you saw from past Pongs and other gaming types of that nature. This actually uses physical mag- uh, computerized magnetic technology. It's, you know, it just it was really cool to watch. In fact, 
A lot of our pictures and videos we have up now on our Facebook page, Twitter account, and Instagram account, where I've got a lot, all the stuff that's displayed out. Just go ahead and reach out to us at Pop Culture Cosmos on Facebook, Pop Culture Cosmo on Twitter, and Pop underscore Culture underscore Cosmos on Instagram. And you get to check out everything that I saw at CES. Coming up next, we're going to be talking about our thoughts on the hire of John Lasseter, formerly of Pixar. He's going to be helping to run Skydance Animation, which is uh, kind of troubling for a lot of people for a lot of reasons out there. We're going to talk about that more here in a few minutes. But first, it's an interview that I did at CES. This is one more. We've reviewed their earbuds before last year, one of the best earbuds that we've actually ever had here at Pop Culture Cosmos. If you want to check out my review of the One More IB Free Sport earphones, it's available now at the popculturecosmos.com and popculturecosmos.wordpress.com website. So you want to check that out right now after you listen to this interview of One More at CES 2019. This is the PCC Multiverse. All right, back here once again at PepCon at CES 2019. It's Gerald coming right back at you here. And what do you know? I'm walking around the floor, and I see something very familiar to me, especially because of the fact that because I review so many earphones out there, headphones and whatnot. One of the best-reviewed headphones I reviewed last year was from One More, the IB Free Sport headphones. Amazing pair of Bluetooth headphones. And if you haven't gotten them yet, it's a great offer at a, at a great price. Check out my review. It's at popculturecosmos.wordpress.com, popculturecosmos.com, back episodes of the show. Gave it a four and a half stars out of five. I've got Joseph Thrasher here, who obviously gave me the opportunity to actually go ahead and was very gracious in allowing me to take uh, liberty and to review the uh, actual earphones. But what have you got planned now? You've got that great IB Free Sport headphones that are out there. What do you do for an encore? Well, we are showcasing our uh, CES Innovation Award headphones here, specifically the Penta Driver, which is a five balance armature headphone, uh, the Spearhead VRBT, which is a uh, graphene driver with a dual dynamic as well. And on top of that is our Triple Driver BT. All three of them won rewards. The Triple Driver BT is a step up to, we'd say, our Triple Driver wired headphones. Same hybrid acoustic, just has a neckband uh, style with all the, the phones going away from the audio jack these days. Uh, Bluetooth is the what's in right now. So <laughs> we're sticking with it. Believe me, I know after uh, most, virtual, actually virtually all of the headphones that I got the chance to review out there last year were essentially in some form or another Bluetooth related. So what does that tell you about the market as a whole right now as far as all the earphones, headphones and whatnot being so devoted to the Bluetooth option? Yeah, I mean, it just kind of, personally, that's just the way it's, it's going right now. And we're going with the flow. One thing we did notice is the True Wireless. And we do have a pair of True Wireless here as well. You know, I see so many people walking around with those Apple AirPods. I mean, everyone loves their Apple products. Um, so. We gotta we gotta stick with the, the tides and uh, roll with the punches. And right now, that's Bluetooth. I noticed I get a lot of feedback as far as, eh, they're okay, but for the price, they're a little bit overrated. Yep. I know there's a lot of people willing to jump into that marketplace, and I see right now one more has that option available. Yep. And the, where we stand out per usual price, our True Wireless headphone is going for ninety nine dollars, and the durability and the design of them is uh, top notch. Uh, I've had mine for about a month now, and I haven't used anything else. I absolutely love them. We stopped uh, mass production on them, actually, to uh, incorporate a new chipset with Qualcomm. We'll be announcing that tomorrow, uh, Tuesday, here at CES. Uh, so that's going to extend the battery life. So uh, that's what's setting us apart for True Wireless battery and price. Okay, well, you, it's going to take a lot to get those IB Freeze off my ears, because I'll tell you what, those are my number one choice right now, because uh, I just enjoyed the fact that the comfort Yes, the affordability obviously was a great option, but the comfort and also the music capability, the sound was just unlike anything I've ever experienced in a uh, price range for that type of headphones. Yeah, um, I mean, the IB3 is um, obviously not our highest tier headphone, so. So you got better, right? Oh, we have tons better. We'll, we'd love to get you a pair of uh, one of our award headphones here possibly the triple driver BT. I mean, the IB3 was just a single driver, so wait till you hear one that has three drivers in it. Oh, that sounds impressive. Impressive indeed. But 
as I stated before, I made it available. If you, you know, when you're on popculturecosmos.wordpress.com, popculturecosmos.com, any of those articles, there are links to actually get to your products. But you're here right now, so what is the best way to get a hold of what you guys have at One More? Obviously, our website, onemore.com. We're on Amazon as well, bestbuy.com, uh, Sam's Club for you know club members as well. But right now, those are the four, four or five major sites. And obviously, uh, for you pop culture fans, hit that link. <laughs> Absolutely. And one last question on the over-the-ear headphones, because I did review some of those. More geared towards the working as far as with the gaming operation, obviously what I use as far as in the studio for the radio shows and whatnot, but there's a lot of people out there who have chosen, with the popularity of Beats, to go ahead and use full-size, over-the-ear headphones that have that Bluetooth option. Yeah, and uh, right now we are working for something to come out this year with a Bluetooth over-ear option. That's, as you said, a huge market. People prefer over-ears, and you know we've specialized in in-ears for so long that uh, we want to get something for uh, those people that love over-ears and Bluetooth. So look out for something this year. But the ones you have right now that are available for view are actually corded ones, but still do an outstanding job of providing a dynamic sound. And also, more importantly, if ones with mic microphones attached obviously pick up a lot of good sound as well, correct? Correct, yeah. The Spearhead Gaming Headphone is fantastic. We have the VRX taking pre-orders right now as well. That one is 7.1 surround sound with a maglev driver. We partnered with Waves NX for head tracking, so 3D gamers, if you have a VR headset or just a PC, that sound is gonna move with you as you look at your screen. They sound amazing, they're hard to take off, and they're great for entertainment. If you wanna plug in for a movie, they're, they're fantastic. Uh, it, it, because I recently got a chance to review the Sennheiser GS550s, Similar to what you're talking about, obviously a lot of great features on it. The price, I think, for a lot of people is where it stops for a lot of people. It's like for a lot of gamers, they're on a budget and whatnot. So what is One More doing about that type of situation with their with their own gaming headphones? Yeah, I mean, well, we make everything in-house. So the VRs are currently priced at about, or the Spearhead VR is about uh, 99 and the VRX, I believe, is just going to be 50 more for 150 So. The fact that we are making in-house is really helpful to us. We're not outsourcing anything, so uh, we're staying friendly to the price. Well, that's awesome. That's awesome indeed. Like, like I said, with, with a lot of people, they love those features. They love those enhanced capabilities. But with some, it's just a matter of budget. And with one more, obviously, there are a lot of great budgetary choices. Exactly. So to the, to the audio followers, just the regular consumer. Uh, you can find what you want at one more. Awesome, awesome indeed. Once again, it's onemore.com if you want to find out everything that's going on there, what they're coming out with, what they have already. And of course, they've got a lot of great products as well on Amazon. But you know what? Head on, more, head on down to onemore.com. That's the place to go for everything One More. Thank you so much, Joseph, as always. Again, thank you so much for allowing me to spend some time with the One More IB Freeze that I got a chance to review last year. And hopefully in the future, I'll be able to take a look at more great stuff from One More. Thanks, Cheryl. Thanks for coming by. And uh, thank you, Pop Culture, for all the support. Uh, thank you so much. Again, as always, great to have you part of the Pop Culture Cosmos. Looking for an edge the next time you take on your favorite video game? Then check out Vitabrace High Performance Gamer Wristbands. Packed with the power of fruit seed oil, Vitabrace is clinically proven to help improve performance giving you a better gaming experience. Head to MiracleFruitOil.com and use the promo code MEDIA10 to get $10 off your Vitabrace purchase. Whether you're looking to beat the time on your latest speed run or are fighting your way to the top on your favorite multiplayer or battle royale, Vitabrace can help you reach your gaming goals. Buy Vitabrace today at MiracleFruitOil.com. That's MiracleFruitOil.com. Vitabrace. Win with it. And we're back with the PCC Multiverse. It's Gerald coming right back at you here. If you need a listing of where we're at anywhere in the world, because we get played seven days a week on 15 different awesome radio stations, check us out today. Our entire listing, including a lot of our podcasting options, is available now on our Facebook page, Pop Culture Cosmos. Josh, I know you got a great thing going on with Humanica Media, a lot of great stuff in the fire, a lot of great stuff you're talking about and thinking about. Give us the 411. What is going on with your great thing known as Humanica Media? You can check out a new Topic Ocalypse. What was the last one we did? I put up an interview with Spaces. There'll be a new episode up on Saturday. Uh, I just have a hard time getting around to editing. 
We also got Topic Oculus Media Awards coming out in the next couple of weeks where we kind of voted on our favorite media for media, you know, TV, movies, video games, et cetera, of 2018. So we're going to format that into an award show. You can check that out. So stay tuned for that. That's coming up pretty soon. So keep checking our Facebook page. And you're back on the podcast radio network too, I believe. Yes. Yes. From what I understand. Absolutely. It's great to be back on the podcast radio network along with all of our other great radio stations. My friend, I want to talk to you a little bit about the controversial decision of John Lasseter, once the head of Pixar and the man responsible for a lot of great animation films that they've done, including the Toy Story films, the original Incredibles, and so much more. He was let go after sexual harassment issues at Pixar, which were not just on one occasion, but on multiple occasions there. So he really left on bad terms there. He gets hired, though, by fledgling Skydance Animation, which is in league with Paramount. Now, Paramount didn't know this was coming. Paramount actually has like a dis- distribution deal with Skydance Animation, and they didn't know that actually he was going to be hired, according to The Hollywood Reporter and whatnot. So there's some little bit of juice in, in there but as far as that, that's concerned. So your thoughts on John Lasseter, once the head of Pixar and the guy who actually gets a lot of credit for putting them in a good direction, along with some others like Brad Bird, but putting Pixar on the map as far as a premier animation destination, what are your thoughts on him jumping ship to Skydance animation and the big controversy about him going there, especially in the middle of the Me Too movement? See, I heard about him getting the boot from Pixar, but the whole Skydance thing, I'll be honest with you, I'm just hearing about. So, I don't know. Well, let me ask you this. If you're running Skydance Animation, you've got the the, the knowledge that, yes, he helped build a, a big-time conglomerate in Pixar, but unfortunately, it also created quite a bit of controversy as well. Okay, well, let me let me pose this question to you. The average moviegoer does not look behind the scenes at things like we do, right? So they're they're going just to see a movie. They're going to see the quality of the movie. They could care less about the producer, the director, the animator, whoever was involved in the flick. You ask anyone who went to see Finding Nemo and you say, hey, who directed this movie? Probably about 70% of them won't know that it was Andrew Stanton. So as far as like names go and what he did, he creates good products, you know, and, and there's, especially in the hashtag me too movement, there's a lot of accusations flung around and nothing gets proven before anybody gets in trouble for these things. So I think it was, it's a smart move on their part. You know, he's out in the, it's the same way kind of how WB hired, um, what's his name? Uh, James Gunn, right? A lot of people don't, these are just names to them. They don't know what they're involved with. They don't really look behind the scenes like we do. So it's just, it's a chance for quality. You can capture that percentage of the people who are out there looking for, you know, something good, something cool to watch. And, you know, a, a majority of movie moviegoers, you know, outside of the, the critics aren't going to care that much about that, you know, that whole fiasco. So it, it, it's an interesting thing because we're we're now living in this, uh, I don't know, this this time, this territory where, where we're treading through waters that are you know, they're particularly dangerous because we're kind of doing the whole accuse first, prove later type situation. And I think with, with Pixar, it's, it's interesting because, you know, nobody's going to go to a, uh, you know, an animated film, not like they do with, with real time films. They're not going to go to see like a, you know, a cartoon or a computer animated thing and go, you know, that was a really good story. That animation looked really great, but I don't know about that animator. Like he, uh, you know, he might have been behind some sexual harassment stuff. Like, I don't think it's got to the point where that's going to be an issue as far as kids movies are, because that's not really something that, you know, big critics are going to be judging that harshly. But what are what are your thoughts on it? I'm curious, because we always seem to kind of clash on things like this. And I think we're going to clash again respectfully, though. See, it's, you and I can have these conversations and we can respect each other's opinions on it. I'm actually going to go ahead and say it is kind of concerning to me that uh, someone with a repeated history, because there's actual documented cases in, in regards to him at his time at Pixar, 
in regards to the accusations and the the innuendo and and the actual incidents that took place in regards to actual name stars like Rashida Jones. She never went back to work for Toy Story 4, I believe, because of the fact of what was going on with John Laster and and all that. Plus, there were other incidents as well that led up to, I mean, Disney and Pixar were not going to go ahead and let him go unless there was some some real solid stuff there because of what he actually did to help bring Pixar to its glory. So there, there obviously had to be some real hard stuff there for him to go ahead and get the outs and to get a job so soon, even though Skydance animation is comparatively speaking, when you, when you're talking about to Pixar, it is a fledgling operation. Skydance is more known for their film operations. You know, many films that they're attached to and including the latest, what the Star Treks, the mission impossibles, pretty much anything relating to a lot of stuff that JJ Abrams does. That's outside of the star Wars universe. You're listening to the pop culture cosmos. Get ready for Box Art, a gaming docuseries from Pyre Productions and Rob McCallum Films. If you love video games, chances are there's a box cover or cover image that you love and has stuck with you for decades. In our series, Box Art, we travel across North America to visit with the unknown illustrators and artists responsible for creating the most iconic gaming images of all time. What was once scheduled to be a 90-minute documentary is now a six-episode season packed with unbelievable tales that paint a picture of the gaming industry you've never imagined. Just one of the many pop culture projects from Rob McCallum, Empire Productions. I'm concerned about it as someone who, you know, my conversations with Rob McCallum in the middle of the Cosmic Crossfire, this has been a big issue to him as far as in the workplace is concerned. And to me, I, I would find it concerning because I know him jumping on at Skydance Animation, it's going to lead to an uncomfortable workplace environment. First off, because of the fact of where he's been and what he's done. And that cannot be good for the overall growth of the company, especially at an early fledging stage like this. You know, he may bring all these great ideas. He may bring all these great concepts and he may have that magic touch once again, as he did with Pixar. But I know as far as a lot of people are going to be on edge when it comes to working at Skydance Animation. And that's because, like I said, he has that history that comes along with him when he moved over from Pixar to Skydance. No, and I see, I totally get where you're coming from. Eh? So please don't misconstrue that. And I know you're not. I know you're not. I don't want and out there. I'm sure the listeners are not, are not either. But what I'm saying is that animated films are less under the knife for that kind of thing, right? Because you're not seeing a face on screen. So a lot of people, they're not going to relate so and so did this versus what, you know, what they're like in the outside world, especially like in this case, it's really just you know, it's an animator or it really an idea person. So it's not something like you, the, the, the mom who takes their kids to see a movie. Well, yes, they should do some research on what goes on behind the movie. They're not going to be like, Oh, this guy, you know, they're not going to put the, the facts together and say like, Oh, this guy is, is a perv or whatever, who made, you know, this, this cool little animated movie about a lion or a fish, you know, they're, they're not going to put those pieces together. And I totally get where you're coming from, but, you know, for someone for a company like Skydance, their animation or whatever, it it sounds like to me they don't have a lot to lose in this scenario because they're so small and kind of at the uh, the birth of you know what they would like to be. So there's not really a lot to lose for them in this scenario. And it's like I, I guess you're saying it's like Kevin Spacey. Kevin Spacey, because he's a star, because he's out in front of the camera, he's there, his presence is there, so you can't miss it. So if he's got issues or whatnot, a lot of that that's right there up front and in your face. Whereas if it's a director, producer, executive, those are just uh, usually names to people that are listed on the credits. And like, unlike you and I, that actually looks into deeper into things because we, you know, that's that's what we do for the shows and whatnot it's maybe it's not as not as important to them uh, except for just the finished product right because we i mean what's a there's no better term for this but we are film snobs you know like people say oh that was directed by kevin smith or that was directed by james cameron we're like oh yeah and he did this movie and this movie and this movie but you you go up to the average person who just casually goes to the movie theater i'm like yeah that movie uh it sounds pretty good it was directed by uh david fincher and they're like who who like they don't they don't they don't really pay they don't grasp on to names they grasp on to actors so somebody in this position they're not an actor they're not on screen so it's going to be harder for people to 
kind of relate a situation to, you know, an individual's actions. Uh, that's that's understandable, and, and like you said, and like you said, most of the individuals out there, they just want to watch the movie for what it is, and, and not everybody is always concerned about what goes on behind the camera. They just like to see the thing, you know, what what happens as a result of what's on it as well. So, I can get, I can totally get as far as understand what you're saying. I just, if you're someone that's working at Skydance Animation right now, I can just say that maybe things are are a little bit more nervous and a little bit more tense than they were before. What are your thoughts out there on John Lasseter getting hired by Skydance Animation? Ex-Pixar exec moves over after uh, several sexual harassment innuendo accusations and incidents happen. He moves away from Pixar and heads over to Skydance. Is this a good move by Skydance? And what do you think Paramount, their partner, is thinking right now with John Lasseter moving over to Skydance? Share us your thoughts. Pop Culture Cosmos at Yahoo.com. Also, as well, Pop Culture Cosmos, Humanica Media, and Game Source on Facebook, Twitter, and Instagram as well. Well, before we come back with our talk about Bungie and Activision and Destiny and all that type of stuff that's going on, because they just hit the news this week with a big change going on with those companies, we're going to go ahead and have an interview right now with Ampere at CES 2019 about their great charging products and then right after the break before we get into destiny and activision and all that we're going to be talking to our friends at unis from ces 2019 about their awesome atari pong tables this is the pcc we are back once again at pepcom and ces 2019 i'm here at the ampere booth with chase larson who is going to run down for me the reasons why I, and you out there, especially if you need a lot of battery for your cell phones or for any wireless device, an Ampere with, uh, what is it, the Hypercube, is that correct? Yeah, so we offer two wireless charging products. The one that we're really showcasing here today is called Unravel. Oh, okay. Um, That's more of a travel version, whereas the Hypercube is more of an in-home bedside solution. Okay. Um, So is it a wireless charging pad or is it a lot more? It's, um, well, in its simplest state, we'd like to say it's a three wireless charging pads. Oh, so nice. it's three 10 watt wireless charging pads, but it's a little bit unique compared to what's already on the market. Our design can fold up into a stack if you're short on space, and so you can just charge one device. You can fold it into a triangle where we have magnets that hold it and it locks directly in position for watching TV while you're charging or FaceTime in someone. Or uh, you can lay it flat and charge three devices at the same time. Oh, that's very nice. That's very nice. Now, as far as when you do that, it also saves a lot of space, correct? Yeah, so um, that's part of the idea for uh, the the travel aspect of this product, is that you can stack it up and fold it and put it in a travel-friendly case and take it with you. Now, what is as far as the recharge speed? Because I know everybody's out there now, and and originally when wireless pads first came out, it was just like, thank God, we just have wireless pads that are out there to charge. Now it's like, what have you done for me lately? And this sounds like it's an all-new twist on that genre. Uh, yeah, I mean, with this, uh, this is a 10 watt wireless charging pad. The traditional ones are five watts. So just in that, it's you know almost twice as fast if you're using a Samsung product. It will use smart charging to charge your device as fast as it can accept that charge. So some devices still can only accept five watts, and it will charge those devices at five watts. For example, Mac products will accept 7.5 watts, and it'll charge them at 7.5 watts. Or Samsung products, for example, will charge at the full 10 watt, and it'll charge those at 10 watts. Very good for someone who actually has a Samsung phone right here, so that's <laughs> awesome. But exactly um, as well, you know, what are some of the great features that, you know, as far as you've told me about the charging and all the great other things that are, other, that are there, but what else do you want to tell me about all the great products that you have here at Ampere? Well, we're really excited about this product in particular. It launched on Kickstarter and the reception was amazing. So we continue to release colors as people were asking for them. Our most popular color is glow in the dark. So if you can't find where your uh, your wireless charger is in the night, you'll have a little glowing ring and you make sure you can find it. And it probably integrates with whether, like you said, a smartphone or a cell phone device and integrates almost like an alarm clock. It does. And so the Hypercube product is more of an alarm clock system. So that one we, are, we have not re- yet released. That's the more robust version of this wireless charging solution. That's almost got a full light spectrum, like smart light, almost like a Philips Hue that you can control from the app or from the cube itself. It also has the sleep sounds and an alarm clock. 
Now, one last thing I got to ask you when it comes to all the great stuff that you have here at CES 2019 is when are all these products out? You, talk, you talked about Kickstarter and all that. What's going on with the actual products themselves? When are you going to make all these things available? And where can someone find out more information on all these great products from Ampere? Um, the Ampere Unravel is currently on sale, uh, and we're currently shipping that product to customers. So if you go onto our web website, ampertech.co, you can find our Instagram, Ampere Tech, or our Facebook, Ampere Tech, and you'll see all of our products, and we can make sure that we can uh, get them to you as soon as we can. That's awesome. That's awesome indeed. Once again, just a lot of great products right here at the Ampere booth. Chase Larson, I just want to tell you thank you so much for taking just a little bit of time here at CES 2019 to talk about all the great products that you have right here at Ampere. And tell you what, I'm, I know my battery's running low already, so it's probably itching for something from Ampere. I right, go ahead and set it on the charger. All right, thanks so much. Thank you. If you're tired of sifting through flea markets for rare and unique games, we can help. Retro City Games in Henderson, Nevada, only five minutes from the Las Vegas Strip, has all your favorite gaming staples, classics, and a wide selection of rare games with new stuff always appearing on our shelves. Come in and chat with Nicole or Doug about your love of games and watch as they help you complete your collection or find your childhood favorite. And don't forget, Retro City Games loves trade-ins. So if you have any Nintendo, Super Nintendo, Sega, Xbox, PlayStation, or even PC games, come in and visit Retro City Games today. Welcome to the new metropolis of gaming, Retro City Games. All right, I'm back here at CES 2019. I'm here at the Eunice and Kalinfer booth, but Steve, I'm here with the CEO, Stephen Tang, and I want to talk to you a little bit about what's going on in the world of pop culture when it comes to a lot of retro gaming and things of that nature, but one name is near and dear to my heart when it comes to retro gaming, and that's Atari, and you're here at CES to really just showcase your line of Atari Pong tables, is that correct? That's correct. You know, Atari Pong is the most iconic, uh, you know, licensed brand that uh, probably the most recognized uh, as far as I'm concerned, and that's why we went so aggressively to get it. And now we have, we have brought three product lines that is promoting the Atari Pong. Well, I'll tell you what, this is way more detailed than the Pong set my dad got me and my sister way back in the late 70s to tell you how old I am and how fond I am of Pong. It'll tell you right here. If you go ahead and check out everything that's going on, I'm sure at Eunice.com or is it? Uh... It's uh, tablepongproject.com, uh, uh, the website that, that hosts all our Pong uh, products and also our Facebook is extreme, extremely well informed as well. If you look under Atari Pong Project, you'll find it on Facebook. So both places, the information is there. Okay, because I'm telling you right now, you have got to see this to believe it when you're talking about full, not only scale model, just full sit down units available for Atari Pong, but full size table units that are just immaculately displayed, full LED visions that you're seeing here. But tell me about the process as far as the Atari Pong units themselves, because it's not just the old digital way of format that you're used to seeing. This is something so much more when it comes to Atari Pong. Absolutely, and I need to go back Jared, to what you said. The technology has changed. From oh, 1970s yeah. to now has changed. My side have changed, culture have changed. Right now we're dealing with millennials. We're dealing with people with a short, you know, a, a kind of attention span. You need a product that capture them. You need a product that is competitive, and you need a product that can encourage repeat play and a lot of safe fun. You know what I'm saying? So when I saw this product, first of all, I would not touch a product that is PC based, anything like that, because that would just, you know, go back to the uh, 1970s. You know what I'm saying? But when I saw this product and how it came together, I was very excited. You know what I'm saying? The mechanical version of Pong, you know, is where it should be. It is. It's beautifully laid out. And does it use some sort of, let's say, a, ma a magnetic type of mechanism when it concerns? Because it's not a digital display; it's something much more. Yes, it's a it's a magnetic uh, system uh, below the uh, you know below the screen that is similar to your mobile screen where the puck lights. It's a combination of uh, physical and software that, that that makes it all happen. Oh, that's awesome! And again, like I said, there's a beautiful LED rainbow display that you can have with several of your units. I'm seeing here both. There's a sit-down version. Uh, that you go ahead like I'm used to seeing and I'm used to playing, but also as well there's beautiful tabletop stand-up, just, just incredible looking units that you have here on display as well. Well, I'll try to differentiate it and I think it's important why we have three separate lines. So the consumer product is good for business to business and business to consumer. So a lot of people in offices space and stuff are also buying the consumer table, which is you know, which is the, the coffee table type version, okay? That table has the most features. You know, extreme music, it's a clock, you know what I'm saying? USB charging and a whole, whole not. However, we are 
we want to make sure that the product also can be put into uh, uh, earning revenue, you know what I'm saying? So we introduced the arcade version, which is very, very uh, children friendly. I've seen six-year-old children selecting the easy mode and playing with their mom and dad. That's a perfect uh, table for family entertainment centers. They give out tickets. And then we just recently introduced a cocktail table, the most robust table we have, the strongest table, the easiest to maintain. You know what I'm saying? That is going to go out to the streets, the bar, retro arcades, and that's where we, we have it. Our product line now are extremely complete, you know what I'm saying, to, to cater to different industries, and that's where we are right now. And that's what I'm seeing now, and uh, I, you know, I see the actual what you have here, not only available for bars and, and like you said, the cocktail table version, so available to hold drinks, it's all set for a real fun time and a party atmosphere. Absolutely, you know, and, and retro is back in a big way, I should just mention it, and you've seen retro arcades popping out, uh, location-based entertainment popping out. Uh, I, I think the reason, because they, they realize that for you to bring people from their homes to play, you need something very engaging. You know what I'm saying? And I most fear that they encourage like, right, social activity and stuff like that. You know, I've actually run tournaments on this Pong table, you know, up to 128 players. Just to give you an understanding that this Pong, you know, is highly skilled, you know what I'm saying? And the more you play, the better you get. I was taking a tutorial right now and I was giving a chance at it. And I'll tell you what, whether you're playing single or two players, it, it just seems very, it's, it's much more in depth than the Pong I was playing so long ago. Absolutely, this one has AI built in, so if you're one player playing a different set of AI uh, speed that you can set, you can start with one, as you get better, you can change the tree. The, the computer is pretty smart, you know what I'm saying? It, it really goes all, out, all the way out to beat you and it help you improve the game. Awesome, I, one last question I want to talk to you about when it comes to these awesome Atari Pong tables is price, but also availability, and where can people find it, whether they're a business owner or somebody that just wants to have it as a nice, decorative item for their home. Okay, to start off, the, the consumer coffee table is already available in stock in America. We have distributors network already set up over there. So the availability right now is now. We've actually been shipping for six months. We started shipping the arcade version and cocktail version just about two weeks ago. You'll probably land in the USA about, I would say, early March, available to ship. Oh, that's awesome, that's awesome. And if anybody has any more questions or wants to find out more information on these beautiful, absolutely gorgeous, that, that sets you back in time, especially like me, that I used to play Pong, just really just bring back the memories. Where can people go to find out more information on these awesome Atari Pong tables? www.tablepongproject.com and if you go to Facebook, you know, if you, if you Google Atari Pong table, you'll find us. Oh, that's awesome, awesome. Steven, it's just been such a pleasure Thank talking you. to you right here. Thank you so much for being part of the show and also part of the Pop Culture Cosmos. Pleasure. Thank, Thank you. you. Thank you very much. And we're back to close out the show. This is the PCC Multiverse. We cannot thank enough everybody at One More, Ampere, and Eunice with their awesome Atari Pong tables. All three companies want to thank them for taking the time to speaking to me at CES 2019. My friend, before we head on out, we got to be talking about the, some of the big news that happened in the video game scene with Bungie separating an announcement today from its partner, of a few years now in Activision. Your thoughts now that Bungie has separated from now Microsoft and now Activision, it's taking the Destiny license with them, but does that mean necessarily they need to go ahead with a Destiny 3 on their own or find another dance partner with them to help publish it out? Okay, so Brett Cruz from Topic Ocalypse had sent me this article earlier today. Because he was last night we were recording an episode and he was praising you know Bungie and Destiny two as his game of the year, and, and it's weird to me because you know I read Jason Schreier's Blood Sweat and Pixels, and he's talking about how there was so much turmoil that went into the development of Destiny, and Activision had given them these deadlines and they didn't think they can make it, but the uh, the pressure by Activision is why a lot of these games came out subpar or just not. You know, they, they were pressured to get a product out and not put all of their heart and soul into it. And, you know, this is something that's been popping up more and more lately with, you know, the existence of deadlines. Like there is all that rigmarole with Red Dead coming out and people feeling overworked. Right. So you have burnout. I, what, I don't know what the term is for this, but they're calling it burnout or they're when it comes time to grind. The people are not seeing their families are working these, you know, these 40 to 50 hour work week. They, they could spend all day at work and they have to, they come home, sleep for two hours, go back to finish the game. You know, you have like people like Corey Barlog of God of War who have to go out and take a, a three month vacation just to be able to realign themselves and come back to work. You know, you're hearing more and more of this. So I'm wondering if Bungie's decision to 
separate themselves from Activision has anything to do with that. But I also wonder if Bungie really has the power to to publish a game like that because Destiny's development, if anything, has been very volatile and the fans have loved Destiny and then they've hated Destiny. So it makes me wonder how sustainable is that formula? You know, how if they have Destiny 3 coming out or any more expansions for Destiny 2 and they don't quite hit the mark, they're going to lose money. And in that case, are they going to have the funds they need to keep putting out more product? I think Bungie's been kind of riding their Halo fame for so long now, and it just kind of makes me wonder if maybe they're thinking that they're going to be more sustainable than they actually are. But where where do you stand on this? I think when it comes to Bungie and Activision and all that, I just think Destiny has not, on two occasions now, met up to expectations as being this supposed AAA game that we were making it out to be. Don't get me wrong, Destiny 1 and 2 have been very solid games, but neither of them have truly become that gotta get a game, that game that the masses have really been behind. It has never topped the sales charts to the extent that I know a lot of people wanted them to because of Activision's power as far as publishing with the Call of Duties and and things of that nature, and also their affiliation with Blizzard and all that. And then also you have Bungie's pedigree with the Halo series. So I think it just, it was a nice thought. It was a nice concept. It looked like on paper, everything was going to be hunky-dory and it was really going to go ahead and get big numbers. But the execution, just somehow there was a disconnect with a large amount of players that never really got into Destiny never really got into the raids and all that. I know Elijah Harrison loves the Destiny series, and he's got a devoted Destiny clan that plays it wholeheartedly. And like you said, there was some really solid favor behind it from your crew as well. But I'm just going to tell you right now, overall, I just it, it never reached the heights as a game, both prominence-wise, sales-wise, and critically, that it should have in order to go ahead and and just get to that next level. It's been a very good seller. It's been a very good game, but it never got to that premier AAA level. I think a lot of people like me were expecting it was going to be. Right, right. And I I completely agree with that. And and also, you have to think about Destiny has been a very volatile property over the years. You know, like I said earlier, it's been it's had its ups and downs. People have loved it. They've hated it. They loved it again. They've hated it again. And, you know, if with Anthem coming out, Anthem's kind of the same format as Destiny with Anthem coming out. If Anthem ends up not being a good game, it could very well decide the future of Destiny as a franchise because Bungie has always excelled at storytelling, right? Storytelling, cinematics, that's been their their bread and butter. So Destiny was a huge chance that they were taking. And if Anthem ends up not performing in the way that people are expecting it to, then that could very well show that you know, people don't really like this type of game as much as we're led to believe. And if Anthem is disappointing, it could very well create a, you know, a burnout effect in games like Destiny as well. I agree with you, man. It's just, it's something that I just, they've never really achieved that level of greatness that they did with the Halo series. Destiny in a lot of ways looks and kind of feels a lot like Halo, but it's not quite Halo to me. Does that make sense? They keep trying to recapture the magic of Halo. And, you know, even the fans have have been giving them goodwill for so long. And then, you know, you had a there's a big falling out with Marty O'Donnell and the soundtrack of Bungie. And then you had Activision pressuring Bungie to make certain decisions in the development process. And while people really like people want to give Bungie the benefit of the doubt, because a lot of people grew up with Bungie. You know, they grew up with Halo. They grew up with Marty O'Donnell. They grew up with those games. And they have influenced them in ways more than just providing them an escape from reality. But, you know, Activision got got so heavily involved and Bungie made so many concessions to Activision that I, I think a lot of people, while still willing to play the Destiny games, don't have the fandom and the appreciation for Bungie that they used to. I couldn't agree with you more on that. It just it, and that and that leads into the question now. Bungie is now off on its own. Whether or not they're going to go ahead and link up with another distributor or another publisher, that remains to be seen. But at this point in time, if you were the head of Bungie, what direction do you think the company should go in? Do you think it should go with a Destiny 3 or do you think it should go in a totally new direction? I think a new IP. I wouldn't keep you know, making Destiny because Destiny has proven to be 
one of those properties that has not only been stressful for the developers to make and keep creating, but it's one of those things like you have to make something good and gamers will love you. But if you don't, they will crucify you in every way possible. So Destiny is, is, is far too volatile. And if I were them, I would go back to making a single player experience that people can play, you know, by themselves or four player co-op or whatever it is and not make something that requires you to be online with other people through the whole time you're playing it. Because, you know, again, Bungie has always been good at storytelling, cinematics, creating a mood inside their games that makes people feel like they have truly escaped the world that they live in. You know, you're not just sitting on the couch, you're in space, you're fighting the Covenant, you're the Master Chief, and the Master Chief has a tragic backstory. That's what Bungie has always been great at creating, and Destiny has never quite managed to recapture that magic but the potential is still there so if they were to apply themselves to something like that i think that people would would greatly jump back on because they have the potential to create the next halo you know not to be cliched but they could create the next halo they could create the next gen game that everybody wants to play they just need to stop trying to milk the fad of games that feature a whole lot of people online all the time because while it's fun to think about it's just not the type of game that everybody is going to want to play it's not a sustainable format so you think bungie even in its position now that it's separated from activision that it's not owned by microsoft that it's not owned by anyone other than themselves being that it's almost like a free agent at this point in time and its own single entity you think there's still a strong future for Bungie and you think they can come up with something that can really transform everything around if they move away from the Destiny IP. Yeah, because they're storytellers and Destiny does not allow them to tell stories, at least not in the way that they were able to do with Bungie. Because remember, Bungie's last game going out, Halo Reach, right? Halo Reach was an absolutely breathtaking game. Everything from the voice acting to the story, the, the, you know, the narrative, the soundtrack, everything about that game evoked some type of emotion and, and the there was better spaceship play in that game than there was at any point in time in destiny right right and it was such a beautiful game and i remember sitting there on my couch thinking to myself like i could play this game forever like because it's such a beautiful even today it, it holds up and they made that they have the potential to make something better than that they have the the team they have the you know all of the technology they need they could create the next gen game that people want to play because they if you remember they opened up the xbox generation with halo combat evolved right and that game defined that entire generation of gaming so with the new consoles coming out if they were to apply themselves to making something like that they could very well put themselves back on top of the whole gaming world if they were to create something that could rival their first one the magic is still there and i think the potential is still there but they need to stop trying to cash in on temporary gaming fads like the always online gameplay what are your thoughts out there on bungie split from activision are you okay with it are you happy for bungie now that they're going to go ahead and and move into a different direction away from activision do you think that there's a great future ahead for Bungie and a lot of great things coming up as far as a new Destiny? Or would you like to see them work on something else? Share us your thoughts on all this, CES, John Lasseter, Skydance Animation, all this, what we've talked about on today's show, anything you want, popculturecosmos at yahoo.com. Also as well, Pop Culture Cosmos, Humanity Media, and Game Source on Facebook and Twitter as well. Well, before we head on out, I want to send our heartfelt condolences from the Pop Culture Cosmos to the McCune family because Earl McCune, who normally heads up the SKO Radio Network, one of our affiliates, his wife, Debbie McCune, passed away earlier this month. Unfortunately, it was a very untimely loss. And our, our just our condolences and our, our just our heartfelt prayers and, and thoughts go to the McCune family. If you wish to go ahead and see what you can do to help out the McCune family, they have a charity fund set up. You can connect it through the SKO Radio Network Facebook page. It's a great loss in, in the McCune family and also a great loss to the SKO Radio Network. And our thoughts and prayers are with you both as we take a moment of silence to honor Debbie McCune. All right, my friend, any last thoughts on the way out? On a few future day, I do want to talk about the Gundam franchise as a whole, because I've been watching Gundam Iron-Blooded Orphans, and 
it really is not the Gundam wing of my childhood, but they are into some deeply philosophical things. Like they, I would love to be a writer on that show. So I do want to talk about that in the future. So let's just be aware of that. Not a problem, my friend. We can talk about it anytime you want on our Monday and Friday shows. I know coming up for a Monday show, we're also going to have an interview with the guys from the Heavyweight Chumps podcast in regards to All Elite Wrestling. We got a lot more great CES interviews in the next few episodes as well. So looking forward to that and so much more right here on the Pop Culture Cosmos and the PCC Multiverse. And next week on the PCC Multiverse on Friday, we're going to be talking about the movie Glass coming out next weekend. So a lot to look forward to in the realm of pop culture. So for Josh Peterson, this is Gerald Glassford. It's another beautiful day in paradise right here in the PCC Multiverse. We thank you for listening. And here's hoping you have yourself a great day. In a world where podcasters talk about the same old pop culture topics, two heroes must rise to bring forth a new era of podcast entertainment. The Cigar Nerds Podcast. Movie reviews, pop culture debates, news, science, and even beer reviews. We're stranger than stranger things and funnier than an evil sewer clown. CigarNerdPodcast.com You're listening to a Weeby Geeks Network podcast. This has been a broadcast of the ESO Network. Be part of the crew and help support our shows by donating to our ESO Patreon or by shopping through Amazon.com or the Tee Public Store, which can all be found at www.esonetwork.com. The ESO Network, your station for all things geek. Tangent Bound Network. Let your voice be heard. Tangentfoundnetwork.com Thanks so much for downloading the Pop Culture Cosmos and stay tuned as more great podcasts are on the way. Thanks again for listening to us here at the Pop Culture Cosmos.